Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me. I hope you can see me. Yeah. I, would, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this presentation, Dr. Stephen Piper and Dr. Kendall. I also want to express my gratitude because um, it's something like coming back to the roots for me, coming to Toronto, because one of my major areas of research that I enjoy a lot is uh, pancreatic islet biology. So it's like coming back to the roots of my medical training and my experimental training. And I very much enjoyed the lecture of Professor Bliss Wednesday night. So I really like to be here. And today I want to share with you some data on mechanistic mechanisms of postprandial uh, carbohydrate absorption. And here you see also my name and my affiliation. And um, I start with the disclosure slides. So this project was actually supported by my university. There is a, a promise that my travel will be reimbursed by the Beneo Institute. And I'm also a principal investigator in some pharmaceutical studies. Um, but this is not related to the data I will be showing today. I am an employee of uh, Justus Liebig University, which is one of the typical small universities in Germany near Frankfurt. So whenever you come to Frankfurt, you look north, you will find Gießen. Um, mitigating potential bias. Um, sponsor was not involved in the design and the generation of the results and the publication of the study program. And um, so I'm talking about uh, results that are already published. Uh, this should read 2012, and that is OK. So you have been seeing these kind of slides already before. It's about the regulation of glucose hemostasis. Um, it involves control of endogenous glucose production, which is one of the major issues in my project here. Um, different tissues are involved. Um, I, I'm more interested in liver here in this case, not so much in the peripheral uh, glucose uptake of skeletal muscle or adipose tissue. Um, and here you see some historical data on the right side. Uh, here you see that the plasma glucose levels increase excessively in type 2 diabetes. Uh, sorry. Um, following an oral glucose load. This is because the rates of glucose appearance into the circulation uh, markedly exceed the rates of glucose disappearance. The enhanced glucose appearance results from failure to adequately suppress endogenous glucose output and diminished splanchnic glucose sequestration. Um, because the appearance of ingested glucose in the circulation is generally normal. So these are some data from Warren and Eckberg. Um, and here you see that the rate of oral glucose appearance uh, is obviously not much different in the control and in the type 2 diabetics. But what you see most uh, is the difference in the endogenous glucose production. And coming to the known glycemic index concept, um, I would say that um, according to the usage of uh, stable isotopes and, the, and discussing the, the mechanisms of um, the uh, glycemic index, I tried to simplify the, the concept. I would say it's, it's an hypothesis um, that the metabolic effect of uh, low glucose uh, GI foods um, relates to the rates at which glucose is absorbed from the small bowel. So the low GI foods, they would travel along the small intestine where they are digested and absorbed more slowly on the left-hand side. And on the other hand, high GI foods would be released from the stomach and be rapidly absorbed 
um, in the upper jejunum. And these are the hypothesized glucose curves that you would see. So one, uh, the low GI foods, they would produce such a flat curve. And with a high GI, you would expect a sharp rise and an, even an undershoot in the uh, glucose uh, curve. So some of the a known model of uh, a low GI and a high GI substance that, um, that is a single substance that is not a complex food would be to study sucrose versus isomaltulose. Uh, isomaltulose is a carbohydrate with a low GI of about 32. It's a disaccharide occurring naturally as a minor component in honey and sugarcane extract. And as you see, uh, it is a sucrose isomer, only that glucose and fructose are connected by an alpha-1,6 glucosidic bond, bond instead of alpha-1,2 in the sucrose. This label also shows you that um, <clears throat> one of the um, one of the isotopes we, we use in the position of the C6, because C6 is uh, not metabolized or nearly not metabolized. <clears throat> so when you mm, use the deduterated glucose, um, <clears throat> over here it should be, uh, then uh, you, you can be quite sure that uh, it, the, you can use the dilution principle completely without any metabolization. But looking at the, the known data on isomaltulose, um, we identified about 20 clinical studies, um, m many of them quite historical from the 80s. And um, so when we ended up with, or we wanted to look at studies that were involved in bolus drinks, because this was our idea to, to look at the uh, gluc uh, gluc glycemic index in a way that would resemble the clinical oral glucose tolerance test. So these studies, um, or when we omitted all the studies with the other macronutrients, we ended up with uh, 10 studies uh, in which isomaltulose was compared with glucose or with sucrose. The ingested dose ranged between 50 and 70 gram over a period of 1.5 to 3 hours. The overall postprandial glucose levels were lower after ingestion of isomaltulose. That was quite consistent in these publications. Sometimes they were significant. The, uh, the lowering of glucose peaks was significant, but not always. So, for instance, the area under curves were often not significant. Um, but you could say that the peak glucose levels were about 20 to 35 percent lower throughout. Also, this was true for the um, area under curve of insulin and the plasma glucose levels. So knowing this previous um, results or previous publications, we thought that it would be a good model to study sucrose versus isomaltulose to identify the kinetics of glucose absorption under the concept of the glycemic uh, index. And um, this shows you basically the study design. Um, after an overnight fast, uh, a hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp was initiated by continuous infusions of insulin and doubly deuterated glucose in type 2 diabetic subjects. And after three hours, that's about this time, here, after three hours, um, we had, had some evidence of um, an equilibrium, a stable situation. And then we in, gave the subjects uh, randomly a drink containing either carbon-13 enriched isomaltulose or sucrose. So the label was in the glucose position, in the C1 glucose position of the disaccharide. And then blood and breath samples were collected in parallel prior to and following ingestion 
uh, according to a time sampling procedure. I should point out that, coming back, I should point out that uh, the time interval was quite short. It's about 15 minutes. Maybe you can read it here. And this um, gives you the possibility to also um, fit the data according or model the data according to polynomial equations. So sometimes this is necess necessary. And uh, there are some very smart um, approaches here that also take the shape of the glucose curves in consideration. There's, with these kind of experiments, you know, there's always some assumptions. So one of the assumptions we had here was to reach a steady state of the tracer tracy ratio at approximately 2.1%. So we wanted to enrich all the labeled substances by at least 2%. Um, another important um, assumption is that we did not use the um, the known uh, defronso protocol of insulin diffusion. If you want to focus on the liver, on the glucose flux, flux over the liver, you need to have, you need to work with low insulin levels. So we decided to have a, a insulin infusion rate uh, lower than one milliunit per kilogram a minute, and that gives us insulin concentrations that you will later see about 300 uh, 350 picromole per liter, and not the high concentrations that you have with a so-called gold standard of hyperinsulinemic clamp. Now, after the starting the um, insulin infusion, um, the subject received one gram per kilogram body weight of isomaltulose and sucrose, and you will later see how we calculated this. This is the classical isotope, isotope dilution principle scheme, and you always see these kind of schemes when, when you're working with a non-steady state compartment model. Um, here on the left-hand side, uh, it's this, the simple effect of the water glass um, that a tracer is administered at a constant rate to follow a trace in a body pool and the atomic mass of the stable isotope tracer will not change, including that which is metabolized, which is also one of the assumptions. Thus, a known amount of tracer and its dilution in the pool will allow to calculate the size of the pool. This is actually the steady state, a very simple equation that you can use here. So you need the infusion rate, it needs to be constant, and you need to measure your tracer in the blood. And then you reach a plateau, and then you're happy because now you have reached the equilibrium. If you work with a post under postprandial conditions, you, of course you don't have an equilibrium. And so on the right-hand side, you see what happened during the 70s when Steele first time uh, um, published this kind of uh, approach. That was in 1974. Um, so this is actually the steel equation, the first part. The second part is, um, or this is the, the equilibrium part. This is the steel equation. And here we have the Mari equation. This is another extension saying that there is a structural component in your uh, changing compartment. You, you think about two compartments. This is the accessible compartments where you do all your measurements. And this is the non-accessible compartment that you want to identify. And here you have the rate constants, and um, there's also another addition that, that has developed uh, over the years, and that is that you fill your deuterated glucose infusion with, um, also with um, a, a variable uh, um, uh, administration of deuterated glucose, not a constant administration, and that is the red, this is the red RA of T. So what I show you here is how to calculate the total rate of appearance of glucose under the conditions of labeled glucose. And um, from the different parameters you, say, you saw before, you see that actually the total rate of 
appearance is the most complex parameter. And the other complex parameter is the oral um, uptake of glucose. And you can calculate everything else uh, by using simple equations um, when you have, after you have calculated the total rate of uh, appearance. So this is the method, methods part, but actually it's important because this method has so many, uh, you have to estimate so many things before you start all the experiments. And now this is the, the part of the patient. So here you see the basal characteristics um, of the patients. Nothing special. The, these are quite, uh, quite acceptably, um, uh, the, the blood sugar is uh, acceptable. These patients were on diet. They had metformin. So it's quite OK. You, you know these, these kind of patients. They, they are used for metabolic studies. Um, and um, this is uh, the first results. Here you can see what happened when we applied the uh, insulin infusion. And what you can see first is that the glucose levels go down. Uh, and plasma glucose concentrations were similar at baseline before the uh, deserate load started. And we see what has been also, what you can expect from the previous uh, publications, that sucrose gives a peak and isomaltulose gives a smaller peak here, and there's a difference of about 40, 45%. And also the insulin levels show that there is an increase in insulin level with the, glu with the insulin infusion, and there is no rise with the isomaltulose, but there is a rise of insulin with um, sucrose. So actually, the basal insulin levels were increased 3.5-fold prior to the administration of the deserite drink. And uh, we believe that we reached a steady state here, which I can show you later when the glucose infusion rate is demonstrated. And this is the pattern of hormones that should show you that there is a difference between the two sugars, but um, we need to be careful with the absolute values because the hormones, for instance, C-peptide, but also especially glucagon, was measured uh, under the conditions of the hyperinsulinemic clamp, and we've, we think that the, the ratios, for instance, the insulin-glucagon ratio, is probably more important than the absolute value of glucagon. But what you can see here, is mostly isomaltulose results in lower hormone levels, uh, except the GLP-1, where it is the other way around. And here you see the uh, breath 13 carbon dioxide excretion as an indicator for substrate oxidation. Um, you see a slow peak uh, of the isomaltulose curve, and uh, you see a, a quick peak here uh, and you see a difference of the peak time of about 75 minutes. And on the right-hand side, you see the glucose infusion rates. These are the, uh, actually what you change while you do the experiment, while you, they're in the running experiment. This is what you, uh, w when you have your experiment in your hands. Uh, they continuously increase during the insulin infusion, reaching nearly identical peak levels before and three hours after the carbohydrate loads, and this also suggests that an equilibrated maximum was attained shortly before uh, ingestion of the sugar drinks. Now this is my, actually my essential slide. The, uh, here you see the most of the calculated data. Um, in the lower left panel shows the oral glucose rates of appearance which also increased significantly with a fast peak after intake of sucrose. As expected, overall values of oral rates of glucose appearance were lower after ingestion of isomaltulose as opposed to sucrose, and accordingly about 25% lesser glucose amount derived from isomaltulose reached the system. And then another important factor is the endogenous glucose production. Uh, they were comparable in all subjects prior to carbohydrate ingestion, 
at about eight micromole per kilogram and minute, which is quite good under insulin infusion conditions. And the calculated total mass of endogenous glucose production during four hours was about 20 gram for isomaltulose and about 40 gram for saccharose. That means that glucose production was nearly doubled after intake of sucrose compared with isomaltulose. So in conclusion, this gives you sort of an overview, but we must look at the three important factors that affect from uh, our conclusion of this project. The mag most, ma uh, mostly affect the magnitude of postprandial glucose excursions, and that is the rate of glucose appearance here. And that is the endogenous or hepatic glucose release, as you see here. And uh, third is the initial splanchnic glucose uptake. These are the parameters that were, that were most changed in our, uh, under our conditions. Um, okay, so this is my final slide. Um, I want to acknowledge Mai Diang. Uh, she, uh, Mai Diang is my uh, uh, doc, uh, doctorate student. She will have her thesis in a couple of weeks and she received a, a prize from the German uh, Society of Nutrition a couple of uh, weeks ago. And she did, uh, she was, uh, she's very good at doing the calculations <laughs> and understanding the, the equations. Then there's uh, different labs that we work with to measure the stable isotopes. And also there's isotope labeling teams that uh, I acknowledge their continuous support. Thank you very much.